Moreover, this is also the sort of thing which is extremely difficult to garner purely from historical treatments, for while the difference in orientation in a spiritual sense is analogous to the difference between day and night, secular history's weakness has always been its inability to see into the hearts of men. History can show us that two men on a bridge are in approximately the same place. It takes scripture to show us that they are moving in exactly opposite directions. This weakness certainly applies in the case of church history. The Hildebrandian faction, for example, is often portrayed as a reform movement within the church. However, the enforcement of celibacy and the fight against political appointments to the clergy and against the purchasing of positions, simony, had, in the event, the intended overall effect of strengthening the centralized ecclesiastical authority. Power may eradicate certain abuses, then be used to perpetuate far worse ones. Compare the Nazis who ran on a platform of social reform. Although it may be true that many of the evangelism efforts discussed at the outset of this section did have the support of the central authority, that does not mean the motives of the supporters were as pure as the motives of the missionaries, obviously. Increasing numbers and the expansion of areas of influences are both developments which tend to increase political power. But it is clear from Scripture that blocking our vision of Christ with the false substitutes which this world provides based upon a falsely claimed authority is the essence of idolatry, worshipping in effect the creature rather than the creator, Ephesians 5.5. 5. The vigorous pursuit of this process is the worst form of spiritual infidelity, the very trademark of Jezebel. My people inquire of their wooden idols, and their diviner's staff speaks to them. For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have prostituted themselves away from following their God. Hosea 4.12 Whatever the good that centralized and organized collective churches may have done over the centuries, the expansion of authority beyond the level of the local congregation and the inevitable propagation of false teaching has done disproportionately more harm. This is the case because the amassing of power and the motivation behind it requires in general behaviors and policies which have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but which have everything to do with playing the devil's game on the devil's worldly playing field. Inevitably, therefore, so-called Christian individuals, factions and organizations, which engage in such worldly pursuits, instead of concentrating on the Word of God and the life of the Spirit, come to rely upon the tactics and the methodologies of Satan's world system. In other words, while such practitioners may project themselves as servants of light, they are in reality serving a satanic purpose through satanic means, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Behold, I am going to throw her and her adulterers with her onto a couch, yes, into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know that I am the one who tests the desires and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. The anticipation of tribulational events within the messages to the seven church eras, which is found here, is not unparalleled. For example, we also find in the message to the Philadelphians a promise from our Lord of Deliverance from that terrible time. Revelation 3.10 In direct contrast to the Philadelphians' reward for faithful service, our Lord here threatens to throw Jezebel and her followers in Thyatira into Great Tribulation, a clear reference to and anticipation of the Great Tribulation, the very event whose explication forms the subject of the Book of Revelation. Indeed, apart from the absence of the definite article, the Greek phrasing used here is identical to that used for the Great Tribulation. Megalithlipsis versus he Megalithlipsis. Jezebel represents the spirit of harlotry within the church, visible on the part of the leadership and their supporters. As is made clear from these verses, such spiritual infidelity to Jesus Christ, whether by the leaders or the followers, is not only unacceptable to our Lord, but also incurs severe judgment from him. The source of this behavior is the internal seduction of the visible church from within by unbelievers who are ostensibly though not actually Christians. In verses 21 through 23, we find three parties who incur our Lord's displeasure. 1. Jezebel, those servants of Satan in powerful positions 
within the leadership of the church, visible during the era of Thyatira. 2. Her adulterers, supporters, enablers and abettors of this false authority. 3. Her children, the doomed offspring of this diabolical union of false authority and false teaching, that is, converts, who are in no way genuine followers of Christ. The phrase you who tolerate is, as pointed out, a collective reference to the entire church era. Toleration of evil is always dangerous on any level, Deuteronomy 13.16. However, active participation in evil is always disastrous, for such a course destroys one's own faith even as it takes part in the sins of others. Jezebel's adulterers here find themselves cast upon the same dining and reclining couch with her, an image of participation in festal and obscene communion with this agent of Satan, for which allegiance they will pay a heavy price, Isaiah 59, 2. We may take great comfort in the fact that our Lord was well aware of the desires and the hearts of all groups during the era of Thyatira, verse 23. And thus is it ever so. He always gives to each one of you according to your works, verse 23 so that while the corrupt leadership is frustrated and ultimately eliminated, along with all who facilitated its evil plans and its children, that is, those who are brought into this false family, are stricken with death, verse 23. We who truly believe in and remain faithful to him can anticipate not only deliverance, but also an ultimate reward, not worthy to be compared to the pressures under which we may now find ourselves as a consequence of such satanic opposition, Romans 8.18 8, and 2 Corinthians 4.17 And to the rest of you in Thyatira, as many as do not hold to this doctrine, you who have not acknowledged Satan's deep teachings, as they call them, I am placing upon you no further burden. Only hold fast to what you possess until I come. The first thing to notice here is that the doctrine and the deep things are one and the same, namely, the teachings of Jezebel. In respect to the latter element, deep things is the name which these false prophets give to their doctrine. They do not call their teachings the deep things of Satan. Rather, the qualifier of Satan has been added by our Lord to make clear the true nature of the false mysteries they are promoting. The doctrines of the increasingly secular, and hence satanic, Jezebel leadership of the church visible were described earlier by our Lord as teaching believers in Thyatira, to commit sexually immoral acts and eat food sacrificed to idols. That is, as we have seen, to choose the course of spiritual unfaithfulness, following after the false idols of this world, substitutes offered up by these false prophets and their true master, the devil, rather than following after Christ. These teachings, doctrines and deep things all represent the intricate fabric of lies, false rituals and concocted human dogma designed to provide the power-hungry leadership of the church, visible during the era of Thyatira, with a basis for their false authority.